a better shape, right? Uh, first, I want to thank you, Mr. Epstein, for uh, presenting this wonderful idea. You usually call me Gene Camille, but thank you for the respect. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Petrasco, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Second, I admire very much the sense of humor, which is very important, not only because bring a smile on your face, because through a, an anecdote, you present the truth that you'll explain, that it takes 20 minutes to explain it, and a little, say, joke, although I won't use the word joke, but joke uh, would take about a minute and express the same thing. And I'll give you an example. Uh, was mentioned here that Marx so the transition from the idiot rural to the uh, uh, to the uh, workers were urban, what you call you know that transition, uh, and uh, now that transition continue into offices. So it's a permanent transition. That uh, okay. So uh, the anecdote was that uh, two cleaning ladies in in the bureau of the president were talking and commenting about uh, the president of the company. And one say, you know, I don't understand how these guys, you know, get so much money. I never saw him working. All, the, all he does, he stays at the desk, he talks on the phone, and he scribbles something on a piece of paper. You know, that's all he does. I never saw him working. So uh, uh, that kind of uh, attitude, uh, it's it prevalent. Uh, even more so today, to update the, uh, the story, the joke, it's that most of the people that do work home now. So it's another step into disappearing, the office that's disappearing. And you, you might extend that joke saying, I never saw him working. All he does is stays home and he plays with the computer. Okay, so leaving these things apart, I just want to add one more mention. Being a capitalist, an entrepreneur, I mean, I. I Capitalist already, it's, it's a name given by Marx, as you know, introduced by Marx, is a pejorative uh, uh, term. So I'd like to, uh, free, free enterprise is better or, or entrepreneur, you know. Okay, if we have to use capitalist, you know what I mean. I don't look down on that. Uh, from 100 people that have ideas, about 80, 70% would like to try. About 50%, they stop when they don't get funds. You go down to another 30% that usually get better advice and they first try look at jobs. Uh, they were not successful. Uh, and he, they will stop and see, well, it's not my day, my year, or whatever. We come down to about 1% of the people that have ideas that succeed to do something. Now we're looking at these people like, hey, filthy rich, you know, he got lucky or some form of derogatory, you know, form of saying it. I, we should look at these people as absolutely heroes of the society. They push society forward, you know. And in today's press, I have to say, unfortunately, this negative attitude about people creating. It's something that, for me, is a paradox, and, and I totally resent it. Uh, it's uh, anybody who, who is a success, technically, it's, it, it, it's a monster, one way or another. Anyhow, I don't want to take your time and uh, make another speech, uh, but that's about what I had to say. Well, well, I appreciate the contribution. Of course, obviously, mental work is, uh, is often uh, difficult to observe, and people are actually uh, producing mentally. And of course, I admire entrepreneurs, uh, but uh, I also uh, want to uh, emphasize uh, that uh, you, know, you don't have to be an entrepreneur uh, to live under capitalism, to be a productive cit and, re and respected citizen under capitalism. And even the creative destruction that I spoke of, m in most cases, if you're the sort of person who, who wants a secure job, you can go into various industries uh, that uh, tend to survive, you know. Ripley's chewing gum, you know, there's, there's a lot. We still chew gum, you know, we've been chewing gum for the last hundred years, maybe we will, we will for a long time. If you want to go into an industry uh, that will be probably secure, uh, and where if it ever does downsize, will probably be due to attrition, there too, uh, you can have a stable life. 
And so we, 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 while we admire the entrepreneurs and those people who create, and while we also want to point out that, that, that what, they, what they earn is, is, is very much the lower bound of what they've contributed. They just get the residue, the residual uh, profit from all of the enormous output that they've, uh, that they've uh, <coughs> created. Uh, and that's all they are going to get under free market capitalism. Uh, that there is also an honorable place for those who work. Uh, now, getting to those who, who in the, uh, I'm dealing with the economy I know best, those who are, uh, are on welfare and social security who want the system to support them uh, without working, uh, whatever else we might say about that, it, it ends up being a Faustian bargain. Uh, that, uh, that tends to explode in the US. Uh, the Faustian bargain is that uh, the economy is not going to be able to afford it, that the debt and the, and, uh, and the commitments that are made, promises that politicians make uh, to uh, pensioners. Uh, there's tra tragedies going on in the US right now in Detroit, Michigan, where pensioners are not being supported. Uh, that, unfortunately, is a Faustian bargain. Uh, but those who want to work under capitalism uh, will, will, uh, will certainly survive and prosper. Uh, any other comments, questions, uh, doubts? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I have a question about the inequality middle that you said. Yeah. To me, honestly, I think that it's the both of the options are lost loss situation because wow. the first one, the rich are getting richer, and yeah. for the second one, the poor are getting even poorer. Which one do you think it applies to, like nowadays, our situation? Oh well, I can't go back to that. Huh. Well, uh, well, uh, okay, let me just. Just to add to the facts about what you said, I I, and it, I can't throw it up. Yeah, yeah that uh, you know, thing. I can, it, uh, yeah, the inequality. Oops. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, just read it again for a moment. Uh, that um, um, inequality. Well, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I said the top one percent increased their income by fifty percent. The bottom ninety nine percent increased their income by thirty okay. percent. So the rich are getting richer. Uh, but the poor, the 99%, are increasing their income by 30%. Now, you would probably prefer, and as a matter of fact, I would prefer, that it be the reverse. So the top 1%, say, remain the same or increase by 30%, and the bottom 99% increase by 50%. I, I want poor people, and as a matter of fact, by and large, that is what happens, by the way. Uh, I, I think it's, it's clear enough that under free market capitalism, it's really the, 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 the broad mass of the people who are benefited. Um, I, could, I could tell you why. But I only want to go back to your point that if it's a forced choice, recognize that in one case, the, the, the bottom 99% are increasing their income by 30%. In the second case, now I'm not saying that those are ideal choices. If that's your point, that those aren't ideal, you prefer a, a, an option C, then we could talk about that and I think you'd be right. But all I'm saying is that if it's a forced choice uh, where the bottom 90 or 100 percent are, are, are losing 30 percent, but ah, the rich are losing by 50 percent, what joy? They're, they're, they're losing more than we're losing, and so we're all going down, but at least they're going down by more, <coughs> versus a situation in which the, the bottom 90 or 100 percent is really better. Wouldn't you prefer option A? If it's a forced choice. Unpleasant choices, really. Well, you, know, you don't know. You haven't made up your mind. No? Wouldn't you prefer to be 30% better off? Well, why, why do we make it even yeah, but I'm going to be 50%. What I'm saying? Yeah, okay. 30% they increase by 30%, but the rich are getting richer by 50%. Yes. So, what is the point? You know, because well, the point is you're going to get richer by 30%. Yeah, but then the rich are getting richer by 50%. So then, what's the point? Okay. Getting poor, getting poor as well. So there's a bit more equality. You have a better standard of living. Yes, the rich become filthy rich, but at least the poor are now middle class. Unlike in option B, where the rich are now just wealthy and the poor are dirt poor. Well, option B, in fact, everybody's everybody's getting everybody's being brought down, but you have the pleasure of knowing that the top one percent are suffering by even more. I, I, all right, I mean, in, in this case, let me make the point really uh, that that you know mass that 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 mass production mainly benefits uh, poor people really. Uh, over the over the broad sweep of history, you know, I mean, the classic point is that is that rich people really uh, object. The rich people of the, of the 1900s uh, object to the fact that 
they had a, you had now they used to have the beach themselves. I mean, it, it really wasn't an ounce to it. Uh, the, the beach by the ocean, the rich people had to themselves. And then suddenly we create cars and we create transportation, and it's flooded with poor people. Uh, poor people are now going to the beach too. And so really, that, that's, that, that, that beach metaphor is more or less what happened under capitalism. It's now everybody can, can go to the movies, uh, every, everybody can enjoy mass culture, uh, all of these things. And you know, the damn poor people are, are we're up to our necks in these people. The traffic jams, we can't get around anymore. What was it in the great time when we could go around on a horse and buggy and, and we didn't have all these poor people? We ran, we ran them over occasionally on a horse and buggy, but we didn't have to, they, they didn't get in our way. So really, by and large, it, 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 it's what, what actually does happen is that, is that the broad masses of people benefit more. Because really, I, I, I personally cannot think of, 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 a, of, a, of, a, of a billionaire who's made a fortune of money in the US economy, which I know of, who, what, who did not make that money selling to the broad masses of people. That's where the money is. And of course, the reason why that's where the money is is because of the earlier point I made, that market wages uh, tend to rise. Market wages hold their own because of the very nature of markets. Uh, but I, I, I have to say I'm a little bit dismayed that you don't know that, that, that you don't, you're different between A and B. They're both terrible, but I respect your opinion. I certainly can't argue. It's a matter of personal values. We have yes. a question. Yes. 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 I just wanted to, to propose a topic of conversation and ask sure. your, uh, your opinion on uh, one thing uh, related to the Scandinavian states, mm -hmm. uh, which are uh, by large uh, uh, social democratic yeah. uh, in government, and yet uh, they are so called leading parts. Uh, they try to help everybody, at least in their own country. Uh, and in the same time, uh, they have the highest standard of living, uh, not only in Europe, but in the world. If you take Norway or if you take Sweden, uh, you'll see they're always in the top list of high standards of living. So and it's not well, quite, quite a yeah. paradox. Yeah, well, I don't think it's, uh, I, I, let me tell you, I don't think it's bad. So let me tell you another funny uh, Milton Friedman story. Uh, he visited uh, Sweden, and he was told by his host, we have no poverty in Sweden. And Milton Friedman answered, that's interesting. We have no poverty among Swedish Americans either. Uh, now, in fact, if, if you look up the data, there is actually less poverty among Swedish Americans than there is among Sweden, Swedish in Sweden. Uh, we, we, have, we have a small country with a certain kind of culture, uh, and uh, inevitably, uh, that hardworking, cohesive, homogeneous culture is going to do well. Now, I would, it is a counterfactual, I would say they do fine, since they're all Swedes, they all work, uh, they do fine without their welfare state, uh, because, uh, they, because they all work, and really it's just round trip dollars. They, they give to the government, the government gives back, and the government takes a piece of the action and probably impoverishes them on net. Now, I can't prove that to you, but I can suggest to you that if you believe my statistic, that the poverty among Swedish Americans is lower than it is in Sweden. Uh, but by the way, uh, poverty, poverty in the US is lower than in almost any other European country with the exception of Germany and Sweden. I mean, it's one other country. But German Americans live a lot better than Germans do, and Swedish Americans live a lot better than Swedes do. Maybe that suggests to you that culture resolves the paradox that you're wrestling with, and that has nothing to do with their welfare state. Or even logically ask yourself, what is the welfare state really doing? But simply, uh, you send dollars to the government, it takes, takes a nickel out of, the, out of that dollar and sends you back 95 cents. Where's the advantage in that? Why not keep it? If you have a cohesive society, which by the way, in the case of Sweden, Denmark, their populations are respectively less than the population of New York City. Tiny countries, tiny homogeneous countries. So that's where I would resolve the, the, the paradox and, and try to point out to you that maybe culture is what matters and not the welfare state. Yeah. Okay, another question over there, please. I lived 30 years in Romania and 40 years in the United States, and I came here to, to teach about globalization. Uh, I hated the Romanian communist system, and I ended up disliking the American system. However, 
Ukraine and the top of 10% of the Americans from a material point of view. I have no reason to complain whatsoever. It, what happens is that ideally, I would like to, better, to see a better world. But there is no way a better world. And I remember what Churchill said, that capitalism or the capitalist democracy is the worst, the, is a bad system, but it's still the best in the world. So there is not much choice. The, we are looking for ideals, but ideals do not exist. We have to improve our lot and try the best. And practically, what it is what I advise my students, do your best and you will be much better. My question is this, however. Take Romania or Eastern Europe or Russia, which is part of my specialty. For 24 years they've been under a transition that did not make most of the people better off than before. They are freer, they, they have more democracy, but from a material point of view, there is a big discrepancy between those who have made it and those who are at the bottom of the society. In Romania, half of the population is rural. They live with hope, but the way I see it, it will take at least another 25 years to get substantially better off from a material point of view. That means 50 years, that means a generation. Well, it's hard to live only with hope. And capitalism and globalization promise a better world, delivers a better world, but it takes a long time to get there. How yes. do you see the transition in Eastern Europe, in Romania in particular, from yes. this point of view? Yes. Well, thank you for that eloquent statement to begin with. Let, let, me, let me add it to you slightly. Of course, Churchill said that democracy was the worst form of government, except for all the others. He said rightly, uh, Churchill actually didn't really appreciate capitalism very much. He was a bit of an opportunist in my view. And, uh, and uh, I even have my issues about uh, democracy. But of course, I, I think your point is well taken. Uh, you were essentially saying capitalism may be the worst economic system except for all the others. But doesn't that partially, of course, you know, people living with hope uh, give them socialism again and they'll live with hopelessness. Uh, so that's not a good alternative. Uh, but, uh, and also, uh, you said, and I completely agree with you, uh, you hate communism, you dislike uh, many things about the American system. I do too, by the way. Uh, I, uh, I, I don't think uh, the American system is truly capitalist. Um, my favorite word, which actually I got from my socialist uncle Abe, my uncle who was a socialist, he used the term crapitalism. And uh, capitalism is more or less much of the system that you find in the U.S. To my mind, it's a contraction. My uncle Abe didn't intend that, but it's a contraction for crony capitalism. Uh, there's so and crony capitalism under capitalism, uh, you uh, uh, for profits. Uh, it's a profit and loss system. Profits encourage risk taking. Losses encourage prudence. Uh, you not only need profits under a capitalist system. You very much need losses. You need to penalize those business people who all the time are making the wrong decisions and are, make, and are losing out because of that, because then you have to allocate uh, the means of production and resources in the direction of making profits, because you make profits if you can actually sell to people. Uh, you make losses when people don't like what you're selling, and those people must be punished, so to speak, through losses. The crony capitalist system changes the rules of that game uh, and, it, and it privatizes profits, but it socializes losses. You lose, we'll pay for it. The rescue of General Motors, for example, by the Obama, Obama administration was a perfect example of that, which essentially took jobs away from all of the other workers in other auto companies in the South who could have provided those cars. Uh, the favor to the ways in which the government basically intervene, intervenes on, the, on behalf of its friends, the bankers, all of that is evil. And all of that slows down the process by which the capitalist system can benefit the broad masses of people. Uh, and so I hate that. Uh, I, in fact, I would, I would say hate because I'm an American. It's not just that I dislike that. I hate that about the American system. And there's so much of it today. Uh, and it's often gone, it goes into the name of Obamanomics, which I think is abominable, uh, to, uh, to, to use another pun. Uh, now, getting to your question, you of course are challenging my knowledge of Romania. You and I agree that it's better to live with hope than to live with hopelessness. Uh, I have been told uh, by some of the economists I've spoken to that Romania could use a much better and much more consistent system of property rights. Uh, 
that, uh, that, that there are various ways in which the, capital, uh, the transition to free market capitalism is being slowed down. I know something about Russia's transition that is ruled by oligarchs, that it really has not made a proper transition. The only thing I, I could suggest to you is that if we had if you have more capitalism, and capitalism again means that the state should should uh, should focus on its sole function, really its function, a police at, at most police courts and property rights, uh, so that uh, to, uh, to to encourage and create a cradle through which uh, people can make a transaction a transition, and of course obviously incur free la encourage free labor markets. Uh, all of those things, I think, will accelerate the process. But that's the best I can do. You probably know better because you know since, as you said, 20 years. I, I didn't realize you were 70 years old. 20 years and 50 years, and you have knowledge of the Romanian economy that I don't have. So that's the best I can do. Be better to live with hope than with hopelessness. But I believe that you can even do better than hope uh, if you have more free market capitalism, which we need in the U.S. as well. I'm curious to see your opinion about the world crisis, and in particular, I'm curious if you expect to see other waves of crisis coming in the near future. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, you said the world crisis, the financial crisis? What's yeah, yeah. What, what word did you use? The world, world, world crisis. The world crisis. Economic uh, crisis. Global. Yeah. Yeah, the global crisis. The global, and and uh, what you well, I, I see many global crises going on. Could you specify? Yeah, I, I was I was specifically specifically talking about the financial crisis. Well, there was a financial crisis in the U.S. You mean a, a financial crisis right now? And which which particular one do you mean? Europe? Yeah, in, in Romania, we're not yet. We didn't pass that point of uh, getting uh, out of the crisis. And my question was, if you expect some other waves of crisis coming. Well, uh, that's a tough question, and uh, I, I think, uh, unfortunately and inevitably, uh, we do lurch from crisis to crisis. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk about it in terms of the stock market. I, 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 I do believe that, uh, that, that on balance we make progress. I don't have to speak abstractly, but if, you, if, if you're talking about uh, the, the crisis in Europe, the crisis in Greece, uh, it appears as though, I mean, there's, there, I, I, my, my general and more abstract view about the nature of these crises is that I think that, that the pessimists often um, underestimate the potential for the, the, the remnants and, and, uh, and the institutions of free market capitalism that we actually do have uh, to, uh, to overcome crises and to muddle through. Uh, when, uh, for example, I published an article uh, a, few, uh, a couple months ago uh, predicting, for example, that the US will uh, accelerate its growth, that better times are coming in the US uh, which is the economy I know best, uh, that I uh, was predicting 4% growth, then, uh, uh, and we've had uh, only about 2.5% uh, uh, growth, but an acceleration of 4% growth. Uh, I have to tell people that 4% growth is terrible. You know, 4% growth, in my view, 4% growth, it compares very unfavorably with what I believe a really uh, unleashed free market capitalism can, can achieve, which is 7% growth. 7% growth is doubling in income every 10 years. Uh, and so I do see abstractly that we're, while we, we, the governments never really solve the problems of crises, they, they create uh, the seeds of the next crisis. Uh, but I do at least see uh, some progress ahead. Uh, I hope that maybe partially answers your question. But if, if you talk about, uh, I, I, I do see some problems, uh, some localized problems that may be difficult to overcome. Uh, but but, but I, I believe that, uh, that there is uh, a tendency to us underestimate the creativity of people uh, who, uh, who actually are working in the free market. Uh, another example, uh, I've written a, a cover story for Barron's recently uh, predicting uh, a, another 50-year uh, a, a era of cheap energy. Uh, now, that is only beginning to happen. Uh, there have been, uh, you know, that, just as uh, the socialists and the environmentalists and the others were predicting what's called peak oil, that, that supplies of oil are peaking, uh, the reverse is actually happening. We're having another kind of peak oil. We're having peak demand of oil because we've, we've discovered such huge reserves of natural gas all over the world 
including in the U.S. Natural gas is now replacing oil. In the U.S., for example, uh, the electric power companies are now using natural gas rather than coal. The U.S. carbon uh, dioxide emissions have declined because they're using natural gas. Um, uh, the, the oil discoveries through deep water uh, drilling, through shale, through oil sands, have added uh, 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 several trillion uh, barrels of oil to the reserves that we didn't know about before. We didn't know about them as recently as 10 years ago. So I believe that we're entering an era of cheap energy. Uh, and that, in fact, the history of the world has been a history of cheaper and cheaper energy ever since the invention of the wheel. The wheel, of course, obviously brought cheap energy because you could roll easily and it didn't take a whole lot of energy to move, 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 move a car. And we're entering another era of cheap energy. And that's, of course, due to the entrepreneurs who are, who are doing things like fracking or discovering ways of, of extracting oil and natural gas uh, through shale. So that will also bring, I think, cheap energy, which is, of course, the world moves on energy, the economies move on energy. That, I think, will also uh, bring a great deal of relief to the world. I should say that's not good, good news for Russia. Uh, Russia is an economy that is based upon, that bases itself on energy. Uh, it's, it's, its treasury depends on energy, uh, on, on, uh, on revenues from oil and natural gas. And I think those prices are coming down, and that will hurt Russia. But I believe to some degree, uh, weakening the Russian economy is going to be possibly good news for those of you who live in Romania. A little less of a chance that an army that's uh, not far away will approach you because they'll have their own financial problems to, to cope with. Uh, they'll become less aggressive. So. Uh, there are different ways in which I think there are better things that are happening. My own, my own approach then is to recognize that while well, governments are always going to make things a little bit worse, uh, because in their attempt to, to, to fix things up, they generally screw things up even worse. Uh, you, th th there's often that hidden market that compensates for it, uh, and that makes things better uh, so that progress continues. I hope that at least partially answers your Thank question. You. Thanks. I have a question. Sure. What's your opinion uh, about the imposing of a minimum wage by a government in a society? And it, it's a very fresh topic in the United States also. Yeah. And how does it impact with the idea of free market? Well, uh, we, we all know that uh, if, if, we, if you followed what I was uh, talking about, uh, we all know that uh, the, the way uh, to earn more is to work more. Uh, the way uh, to, uh, get to improve, improve your productivity is to get a job and uh, to find out how to uh, improve your skills. And uh, to the extent that we impose a minimum wage uh, that's, too, that's high enough in the US to mean that an unskilled young person, I mean, most, most people who earn minimum wage are young people in the US, as I imagine is true here, but I don't know. Most of them are young because, of course, young people are unskilled. Uh, that uh, you're going to make it harder for those people to improve their skills and to ultimately earn more. I mean, that, by the way, is the hit. It, 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 there's the cost of immediate unemployment for young people when you impose a wage that's higher than people are willing to pay. Uh, but uh, you, uh, it, the real cost to them is that over their lifetime, if they don't get that that first job and that second job uh, and improve their skills, then uh, they're going to be penalized. Uh, uh, I have argued uh, that uh, I certainly have no objection to, to the other ways of helping those with labor. In the U.S., there is something called the Earned Income Tax Credit. And, that, and uh, so if you have a job, uh, you can get a wage supplement uh, if we want to help poor people. You know, one way of helping poor people is by giving them money and helping low-wage workers give them money. So you're helping them in both ways by not meddling with the market wage. Uh, then, uh, and then by, uh, by giving them money and augmenting their income. But of course, the whole philosophy of the minimum wage uh, comes from the view that there really is no market wage, from the Marxist notion uh, that employers all determine the wage, that they have the full power uh, to determine the wage. And I was hoping to, to demonstrate uh, through my uh, parable of the car uh, that there's a market, and people, uh, if, uh, people, if your labor is worth something in the market, then you'll, if you shop around, you will likely get a wage uh, that's reflective of that. Now, I mean, the Obama administration doesn't recognize that. Recently, Obama, for example, just last week, he issued this statement. I don't want to offend women in, in the audience, but I will.
say it, that it, you know, it's, it's terrible that what was the ratio again that, that women earn uh, 79 cents for every dollar that men earn, and this is terrible. There was a, uh, you know, a, a good parody of that by uh, a, a colleague of mine named Donald Bujo, who said, look, what the really terrible thing is, the, the, is that, is that uh, for every, yes, every 55 cents that young people earn, the old people earn a dollar. I mean, the huge disparity in income between older people and younger people is just so terrible. And uh, he must want to do something about this too. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, but, but clearly, if you think about it, if, 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 in a competitive marketplace, if, uh, if, you're, if, if you're, 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 uh, uh, the value of your productivity is worth uh, more than you're getting paid, there will be a tendency for you to shop around for somebody else to pay you more. And obviously, young people earn less than older people because they're less skilled. Uh, but of course, you have to somehow or other get over that mindset, and that's what I was trying to talk about talked about when we talked about how to how to argue with the socialists, get up with the mindset that the, that the employers dictate the wage, that it's whatever they want to pay you is what you get. Uh, anyway, uh, could you take so anyway? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, that's all I have to say. That the minimum wage, uh, I, again, it's it's a uh, it's you know it, it, it separates the bleeding heart economists from the bleeding hearts. I'm a bleeding heart economist, and because I'm a bleeding heart economist, I hate to see young people get denied their first opportunity to work and to find out how to be employed. I mean, there was, there was a book uh, called Nickel and Dime by somebody named Barbara Ehrenreich. I don't know if the book ever sold over here, but she works in these, in these places that, that employ unskilled labor, in McDonald's and places like that, and she sort of notices in passing that the supervisor she hates used to have her job. You know, the only way to become the supervisor and get a better job, the best way, is to start at the bottom and learn how the, how the operation works, and then you'll get the promotion to supervise the place. Then you have your value. Uh, then you learn something. Uh, you learn how to work mainly on the job. On the job training is the main way to work. And when you raise the minimum wage, you deny people that very vital uh, uh, aspect of their education. Uh, now, if there are, there are indeed older people who still work for minimum wage who have not improved their skills, and I'd like to help them. I'd like to see them helped uh, through the earnings of tax credit, but not by impeding the labor market. Claudio, also has a sure. question. Please, Claudio. Sure. So uh, I'm getting back, getting back to this riddle that uh, oh. that you spoke about. Uh, what would you say to uh, to people who think that maybe capitalism is is this third choice where the rich get 30 percent richer and the poor get 50 percent richer? Because well, in a in a you know an economy without bailouts, without special privileges, without crony capitalism, odds are this kind of wealth transfer, this legitimate wealth transfer from rich who make bad or poor decisions, poor investment decisions to poor would actually happen. And there's this uh, example of, the, of an economic crisis which happened in the 1920s, which got resolved very, very fast through deflation, where uh, huge, very wealthy people lost a lot of their wealth. And in exchange, uh, a lot of people had their dollars, their saved dollars, saw them worth a lot more. And got the opportunity to buy houses or to buy to buy a lot of stuff. Whereas today, when they combat inflation, they they're actually bringing about both worst the, the worst of out of everything. So the crisis doesn't make the poor a little bit richer like it used to do when there was inflation, but it, it makes inflation and the poor get poorer, which is like the worst of both worlds. So well, yeah, yes, um, yeah, thank you for that uh, for that contribution. You know, certainly uh, I was making it a tough choice. Uh, the A versus the B. Uh, I, I do, uh, by the way, I, 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 want, to, I want to introduce another uh, point, but, but again, elaborate on what is, was just said, that uh, by and large, really, uh, it's, it's the broad mass of the people that benefit uh, from capitalism. Uh, but but uh, I don't believe that percentages and, and dollars really help you uh, figure that out, partly because of the complications of dollars and price inflation, uh, and all of the complicated abstractions that result from it. I, I believe uh, that the best uh, way to understand what happens over time to the standard of living is not to talk in terms of dollars and inflation-adjusted money, uh, but to simply uh, to, to do a, a lower level of, of research and to ask, just ask yourself, what are the material conditions of life of ordinary people? Uh, how do they live now? Uh, what are they accustomed to? 
Uh, how large is their home? Do they have access to a car that they may or may not need? Uh, do they even need a watch? I notice uh, so many young people don't own watches because their cell phone tells them the time. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 if you actually look at uh, what's happened over the long run, then as I say, you basically find that capitalism overwhelmingly benefits uh, the broad mass of people uh, in, uh, to the detriment of the rich. That's if it's allowed to function. I mean, crony capitalism, uh, which, benefits, which, which, which is the government helping the rich, slows that down. And by the way, I, mean, I think that Obamanomics and, uh, and other uh, interventions by government is, have essentially tried to tip the scales. But the point is that when the, 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 when, when, when the broad mass of people move into housing, they move into developments, they acquire cars, they go places, all of those things essentially crowd the rich. Uh, and uh, the, uh, and, and uh, so the privileges of the rich uh, are, are really eroded uh, by, uh, by the advent of capitalism. And everyone has something. Uh, and that's by and large what happened. And so again, I want to tell this young lady that you, know, you, you can reject A and B and choose C, just as my uh, colleague said, that by and large, and again, money incomes uh, and all of the ways in which, I don't know if you've confronted some of these articles, which try to talk about uh, real wages and real incomes. I mean, uh, just, a, just a simple point about the US. Uh, I've read many, many studies that try to talk about where incomes were in 1970 and where they are now in 2014. And you use nominal incomes, and then you have to deflate for price indexes, and that becomes a real mess. Or putting it another way, would you really want to buy the price index of 1970, or would you want to buy the price index of 2014? I mean, the price index of 1970, I'll just mention something. It didn't have cell phones, it didn't have microwaves, it didn't have laptops, it did I mean, a, a completely different way of life uh, uh, in 1970, and uh, things that, that, that ordinary people are used to, uh, they now have access to. Uh, and so that's the lower level of abstra abstraction. Um, and, and, and once you understand that lower level of, of abstraction, then you'll disdain this attempt to take income and deflate them by these very, very loose and abstract price indexes and think you really are achieving something. And that's what, that's what economists prefer to do. But what ordinary people should do is what I'm suggesting. Just look at this, just research the standard of living then and now, and you'll see that the broad mass of the people have usually benefited, even despite the depredations of chronic capitalism. And that unfriended capitalism basically benefits the broad mass of the people, because that's where the money is. That's, that's, by the way, that's another confusion. You see, if you look at income distribution, that's one thing. But in line with the point my friend Camille has been pushing, so much of the income of the rich actually goes to investment. So then if you reduce it then to what people consume, the distribution of consumption, then you find that even under certain distorted capitalism, most of the consumer dollar is with the broad mass of people, so it's middle income. That's where the money is. That's, that's where you're going to make your fortune. So those are the people whom you want to sell something to, uh, assuming you can do so in a profit and loss system that's unimpeded. And that, that's the progress of no capitalism, which is essentially option C. Uh, that, uh, that that poorer people benefit from more, more, more than rich people. Yeah. One last comment from Mr. Camille. <laughs> if you allow me to just to add to the uh, conversation, a few points very fast. Uh, first, I want to answer the young lady. Um, she was not very convinced by, uh, I, I can see that. That's all right, uh, no problem. Uh, I was communist until I was eight years old, uh, so you know I can understand that. Uh, but uh, one of the reason, one of the way of explaining it, is through the uh, positive equality and negative equality. Uh, the two terms are, are, you'll understand right away. The best way, and I can say, have to say it in Romanian. Forgive me. It's Simona Capra Becinului. Uh, it, it's uh, it's something that doesn't exist in any other language in, in a strange way. I mean, there are usually all mechanicals exist. Uh, and and uh, uh, you probably know the story, uh, each wants to have more and more and more. The Romanian wants the other one to have less. That's called the negative equality. Trying to have more or more and more than the, than the others it's a positive equality, and that drives society to do produce, okay? That was the first, uh, and with this one, I somehow, I never closed the subject, but uh, you know, maybe I put just a little brick somewhere. 
Okay, uh, as far as gentlemen here that's looking at the watch, uh, Norway uh, has got three million people, right? No. And it's sitting on probably the, not the largest, but one of the largest oil. Okay, uh, that divided by the population, the income, it is uh, it's unbelievable. And that's not the answer. The answer completely is they have problems. You're gonna say, wait a minute, problems? Yes, a hundred people got killed recently, right? On an island. Yeah. More? More, right? Okay, I'm, I'm underestimating, you know, usually with death, I usually do that. Uh, and uh, so therefore, all these countries, they heavy from what Mr. Epstein said, uh, that th there's the cultural uniformity. It's not anymore. In every country, you see there's laws that uh, uh, stop people from, usually Muslim people, from coming in because they become to a different culture and they start to introduce different way of life and working and different. So in that respect, uh, one thing to be added, as you can see, I keep adding. Uh, us, I'm gonna surprise you very much. Yes, social democracy, but they have, uh, in terms of business rules, they are much freer than even in the United States. That's a society that can produce, it allowed to produce, of course it divides and so on the, 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 on the social level, but in terms of allowing pro the, the entrepreneurs and the companies to produce, they have a freer climate than even in the United States. So that, that adds to the, uh, uh, the thing. In, in ter with the last one, in terms of oil, I want to mention in, uh, what I call the Clubo de la Roma, the R Rome Club, um, the Mr. Dooms, because they see the, the end of the world coming soon. Uh, and uh, they predicted that the United States is gonna run out of, uh, out of uh, oil in the uh, year 2000. Surprise, surprise, in 2020, the projections are they are gonna export oil. Not that they'll be sufficient, they'll have oil to export uh, so much. Somebody says about economists, say that if you can't do it right, do it often. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mr. Uh, Epstein, uh, before closing this meeting, I guess, uh, I have one uh, final request from you. We have some very young people here in the 20s. What's your best advice you can give them in terms of personal path, in terms of careers, in terms of what can they do with the future? Just do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Alex has got the best advice, but look, 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 uh, of course, that I'm, I'm lucky enough uh, to have found my calling in life. Uh, I enjoy writing about economics, uh, but of course, at the age of seven, you know, I was thinking about issues of political economy, thanks to my mother. Uh, and uh, so I, uh, I, I was, by the way, a failed playwright and novelist. I took a detour, and in fact, I was an actor for a while as well. And I took a detour into the arts and found that it wasn't good enough. I uh, probably could have been okay as an actor, but the struggle would have been a struggle. So I got a chance to, to drift into a field that I love doing, uh, and that uh, for the most part I would do even without pay. I don't tell my employers I would work without pay. They don't have to, they'll pay me anyway. Uh, and uh, so I was lucky to find my calling in life, uh, and to find a calling in life that somebody would pay me to do, to pursue. And obviously, uh, uh, for you, it will take some effort and, uh, and some luck to find your calling in life, uh, something that you would do uh, even without money, something you, something you would uh, look forward to doing, that you look forward to today even without money. But of course, since you need some money, you'll want to make sure that that calling also earns you a living. That's the best advice I can offer you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Epstein. Thank you all for being here uh, this uh, rainy morning, for waking up uh, this morning and coming here. Now, I'll all invite you outside for a short uh, snack. It's a chat been waiting for us all. Thank you. No, not outside. Uh, <laughs>